Living Shorelines. Uh, this is an initiative that was started by the In Gardenio Garden Club that, uh, that got the idea of having a vital rosemary to speak. And she approached the local environment group, so she got the Watershed Association and the group, the Development du Lac, Big Totai. And we put our resources together to bring Rosemary here uh, to present on, uh, on Living Shorelines. So this uh, part of this uh, presentation is also funded by the New Brunswick Environmental Trust Fund. And like I said, it's a collaboration between the three groups. So what we're going to do, we're going to have about an hour of presentation, uh, half hour about of questions, 45 minutes, we'll have a coffee break. And then uh, for people that are interested to pursue the conversation, we're actually going to go to the shoreline down here uh, for people that are interested that are, are equipped to do so. And we'll be able to uh, continue the discussion around their actual shoreline, so that's going to be interesting. Uh, housekeeping rules, I guess there's coffees there. The bathrooms are uh, at the end of the room. Uh, men on, the, on my right, on your left, women on your side. Um, so, c'est ça. Uh, Rosemary uh, is someone who studied in conservation, environmental studies. She also studied in architectural design and horticulture and therapy. So, and she specializes in really ecological landscape design, uh, shoreline er and shoreline er erosion and landscape management. So she has her company in Nova Scotia. Uh, she's in Bridgewater, I think. And she has done some projects that, uh, with the uh, Ecology Action Center in uh, Halifax that are really nice to showcase different ways that we can manage our shoreline instead of just the rocks. So she's the expert, she's gonna present on that. Um, so other than that, I thank you everyone for coming. And uh, yeah, Rosemary. Thank you, Ray. Wow, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for that wonderful welcome. I really appreciate being here today. And um, engaging you and stimulating some conversations about our shoreline challenges. I'm uh, just going to check that everyone can hear me okay at the back. Yeah, okay. If you have any issues, just raise your hand or wave or let me know um, so that I can speak up a little bit louder. Um, I'm going to um, introduce these ideas of the living shoreline concepts. They're not uh, particularly new. Uh, in about the 1980s, a uh, group in Maryland in uh, the U.S. started uh, seeing aggressive erosion on their shores and uh, started planting up the, the coastline. And since then, there has been a ton, a ton of research through various universities. Uh, it has come to Canada in the mid-90s or so. And, uh, and currently we have um, University of PEI, uh, St. Mary's University in Halifax, Dalhousie University, and various others who are really diving deeply into this conversation and this topic. And so, um, you know, I'm not uh, just the crazy environmentalist with my crazy little rubber boots out here. Uh, I'm just selling you some, uh, some potion. Uh, we've been working on the coastline since uh, 2001. And we've uh, tried all sorts of remediation tactics and studied and measured and photographed and lots of conversations, neighbor to neighbor, community wide, uh, at the government levels, uh, going to conferences throughout North America to really bring in as much information and knowledge as we can so that we can adapt all of those other methods from other areas to our Atlantic coastline. Uh, of course, uh, especially here on the, the northern side of our hemisphere here, the, we are seeing many more aggressive storms and, uh, and it's really becoming very problematic for a lot of us. Uh, I just want to survey everyone. Does everyone here live on the coast right now? Pretty much. Those of you who don't live there, are you planning to build a home on the coast? Or are you... Uh, 
you know, within a community. Can you just give me a little feedback of who you all are, what your situations are? Are you seeing erosion every day? Maybe that's an easier question. Yeah? And are you noticing the roads are also washing away? Yeah? Sinkholes, potholes, all of that. I noticed just down uh, in Cocan, where we stayed last night, they're fixing the side of the highway, big, big boulders, putting big boulders in place. Yeah, so there's, uh, we see it, right? It's part of our lives now. How many of you are a little nervous about your investment and your inheritance to your children and your grandchildren? Yeah, you should be nervous. You should, that's appropriate, right? Things are changing faster than uh, the speed of light, it seems, some days. And, and it's, uh, it's appropriate to feel a little weirded out about that. I'm going to give you some, uh, some hope today. I'm going to hope that you also <coughs> simulate conversations with your neighbors, uh, with your municipal uh, bylaw officers, with your MLA, your uh, regional and provincial uh, government officials. Uh, this is just the beginning of the conversation for you all and for us. And, um, and it, I'm not going to be able to answer everything today or give you a magic bullet, right? There's no pill that I can offer up that's going to solve these problems. But I can get you a little more education, a little more connectivity, and offer you the, um, the opportunity to explore a little bit deeper and, and really understand what's happening at that living, that living edge that's dynamic and moving really well. Uh, has everyone or has anyone explored any of the, uh, the websites and the information? There's a, a really great um, small website called sealevelrise.ca. Um, if you have a notebook, I would encourage you to write that down or pump it into your phone. I'm going to go there now and I just want to show a very brief uh, two or three minute video that uh, explains a few things. And um, uh, just a quick survey, if I play the video in English, will you all understand or would you like me to play both, the English and the French verse? Just one version, is everyone okay with that? Okay. Both, both. both would be good? Okay, that's great, we'll do that. I'm just gonna turn this off so we don't have some feedback. <coughs> Need my technical person here. This one. <laughs> yeah, there we go. And um, let's see the fries. There we are. Okay, we'll up. Sorry. Okay. Um, oh, can someone help me? Yep. Can we just get it to stay on that? Rise there. Great. So it's this video here. So can you scroll up? Have you seen that that scene with the pavements all torn apart? Have you noticed that in your region? Yeah. Any of your roads have that happen? Yeah. Okay, so let's just run this. English comes up first and then we'll switch over to French, okay? The Maritimes have always had a close relationship with the sea. Well, that relationship is about to get a bit closer. Was this really all that necessary? I mean, I thought the line was funny by itself. <laughs> I'm not here to convince you that sea level rise and climate change are happening. I'm not interviewing a bunch of scientists. I'm not explaining how greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere are warming the planet. And I'm especially not going to go over the latest 3,800 page intergovernmental panel on the climate change report, which assessed over 30,000 scientific papers, all predicting that warming of the climate system is unequivocal and that human influence on the climate system is clear. No, I'm not doing any of that because I don't need to. Sea level rise is happening right now. Inundation of low-lying areas causes a football field-sized area of land to be lost every hour in Louisiana. Miami South Beach is considering spending $400 million to literally pump out water from the rising ocean. Coastal erosion is quickly reshaping our coastlines and removes an average of 46 centimeters of coastal land in PEI now and is a direct result of sea level rise, but it's also going to get much worse in the future. Even if we completely stop emitting greenhouse gases into the atmosphere tomorrow, we can still expect decades of sea level rise. Now in case I'm not coming off like a ray of sunshine right now, don't worry. I'm also not here to drown you with the issues. I'm here to tell you how to stay afloat. 
with three real practical things you can do about sea level rise. Number one, ask your government about their sea level rise policies. It's important for governments to develop coastal policies that help communities prepare for sea level rise. Places like New Brunswick, Newfoundland and Labrador, PEI, and some municipalities in Nova Scotia already have coastal policies in place, but it's important for you to know what those plans are and to see if they're enough to address sea level rise in your community. So write your councillor, MLA, or MP a letter, make phone calls, write that Facebook post, get out on the streets, and invite your friends. It'll be a party. Number two. Use the Canadian Extreme Water Level Adaptation Tool, or CANULAP for short. The federal government has essentially crunched the numbers for how much sea level is going to rise in the next 50 to 100 years in coastal communities from Berryland to Tuk Yaktuk. This can be used to figure out how high you'll need to build to prepare for sea level rise. Check out this website to see how it might impact your own community. Now thankfully, Atlantic Canada isn't about to become Atlantis Canada just yet, but there are areas that are going to be near impossible to keep by 2100. It's important that we establish rules so that developments and infrastructure are not built in these areas, because, you know, that's going to be water in 100 years. Think of it this way. We already have building codes and bylaws, rules that make sure buildings don't easily catch fire, collapse on top of people, sink into the ground, or give into any other force of nature. So maybe it makes sense to have laws that factor in for sea level rise. Number three, be thoughtful about where you build and buy property. Now I get it. Living by the water is really nice, but educating yourself about what the risks are in coastal areas will help keep you from a wave of problems. So if you're thinking about buying land by the sea, find out how much of it is above the canoe lab predictions for the area. If you want to develop a coastal property, choose a spot that's well above the water. Your cottage might not open up to the beach right now, but it also won't open up to the sea in 10 years. And if you already live in an area that's at risk from sea level rise, well, there are ways to stay protected. An extreme example is the Netherlands, which is able to keep 26% of their country below sea level through a system of dikes and dams. But this is a really costly solution, and one that isn't great for coastal ecosystems. So the best thing we can do is to avoid building anything too close to the sea, starting right now. Let's not create any more future problems than we need to. The Maritimes will always have a close relationship with the sea. But for now, I think it'd be best if you were just friends. You know, I hope you don't take it personally. I mean, it's really me, not you. I, I just, I'm not going to The Maritimes have always had a close relationship with the sea. Well, that relationship is... sea-levelrise.ca, so you can just go back to the presentation. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. If you uh, would like to watch it in French, it is available, but the link is just uh, broken right here where we're on a Wi-Fi. So from your home computer, you can certainly watch that, okay? Thank you for your help. I appreciate that. All right, so here we are. Uh, we've just had that little brief introduction, and we're going to just move, uh, move along. So... I just wanted to start by telling you a little bit more about myself and Helping Nature Heal. Uh, we've been working, as I said, since 2001 on coastal properties. Uh, erosion wasn't our first and primary goal at the time. We were doing ecological landscaping, no chemical, low impact, human labor only. And we started to watch our clients' properties wash away. So we have a, a really cool example is we have a, a client's property who when they bought it, it was five acres of land. And so of course they were being taxed at five acres of land. Um, and we started to see the erosional changes. We started to do some work to have a, a bit of slowing down of that to temper it somewhat. And Hurricane Juan happened and then we had White Juan and then the next big storm was our fatal storm where we lost a lot of land. Um, it's very sandy, uh, sandy till beach landscape. And so over that two or three year span, we lost almost two acres of land. 
Phew, that's a big loss, right? So our uh, homeowners went to the municipality and asked them, what do I do about this? You know, it's very clear that we've lost land. We had to get a new surveyor in to measure it. And sure enough, it was just about two acres, 1.98 acres. The homeowner lobbied to their municipal government and appealed their tax, uh, tax notice and they were able to get less tax on their landscape, right? It's less land, you should pay less tax, that's appropriate. Um, this started a real tumbleweed of uh, conversations and questions and what's happening in the bigger picture. At the municipal level, when we have one landowner over another over another losing land to this significant amount, inadvertently that is going to lessen the amount of tax dollars that our, we have in our collective pot, right? In that money that we use for communi community services. And so um, after a few clients went to the municipal uh, in that region especially, then the municipality started to pay attention. It was the first step of awareness for our municipality that they were gonna be on the short end of the stick, so to speak, right? Um, then we started realizing that the real estate values were changing as well. If your property is losing so much material, it doesn't have the same value. It's really easy to see. And so people from away are coming in to buy up these properties and probably build new homes and things on the coast. And all of a sudden, the real estate value is going down. People are not interested in buying them because they're sloughing off at the face. And, uh, and it seems like there's not a whole lot that we can do about it. So we started to lose real estate value in the areas, in these little pockets of areas of communities. Um, and then, of course, once that starts, that tumbleweed, right? It just kind of slowly goes and deteriorates our community infrastructure, our awareness, our happiness, our ability to live there well and feel secure. So we really stepped up our uh, education and our uh, understanding of all of these spaces. And last year we had uh, a staff of 20 people working almost exclusively on the coastline trying to knit it back together. And we're gonna dive into how we've been doing some of that work. So, just gonna pass us along here. Um, we belong to a whole bunch of organizations and uh, we've won a bunch of awards for our work. Uh, the Nature Museum of Canada has recognized two years running now that we're really um, on the leading edge uh, it's the landscaping industry that we belong to, but it's really having a paradigm shift. We are really thinking about, rather than dominating over a landscape and keeping things very pristine and cut and trimmed, we are really kind of flipping that upside down and saying, how can we reinvigorate the natural ecosystems and make them healthier and stronger? We sent uh, a few of our staff back to university. One in particular, Kirsten Ellis, uh, went all the way through a master's program studying our work, passed with flying colors in uh, 2017. And we came out of that process with proof of concept that what we thought was actually happening with our plant-based system was correct and, uh, and that we could see that the proof was, it was there. So the plant-based system that we use is um, acknowledging that the shoreline is a living, dynamic entity, right? Uh, it sometimes grows when uh, the sediment comes back in from the, the winter. Those summer storms bring the sand back into our beaches. And in the fall, during our hurricane season, the sand goes back out. Right? We can see that happening uh, on our property. And we can see that there's animals that come and live and then move out at different times of year. It's a living, dynamic, breathing system, this shoreline. And so once we kind of acknowledge that that exists, then we realize that, oh, because of this dynamics, it kind of seems silly that we've tried to stop it from changing, right? 
who are we to think that we are stronger than Mother Nature after all, right? She's got the upper hand no matter what we say or what we do. Even when we build those really big rock walls or uh, breakwaters and things, boulders fall out of those. I mean, things change, right? The water finds its way somehow in behind those boulders and pulls them out. We see rocks popping out of these systems all the time. It's really challenging to get a boulder right back in place, right? It's really hard to do that. Um, so we end up just adding more rock and adding more rock and then increasing the damage to our communal spaces, right? We think about the soft beachy sand and we think about wading out into the shore and swimming off into the deeper waters. When there's big boulders in there, it's challenging. When there's chunks of concrete and rebar sticking out in that zone, it's really risky for our kids to be playing there. So we are severed from that really lovely dynamic space when we add these big infrastructures into them. It's challenging then to think about, well, if we can't stop it and we don't want to harm ourselves and our ability to play there and raise our kids there and, and have homes there, what do we do in the middle? How do we think about this? So by educating ourselves and understanding what's happening, we can add some, uh, some uh, patterns, some work into those zones. And in this first picture, we can see how there's a rock wall that ends, and then there's planting in front. And I'll just step up here. Can you see that this is a new grass that's been planted in that space? There's some older shrubs from the previous year's work. We have some coarse woody debris in here. Um, and we can see how a few of the boulders, soon after they planted that wall, escaped out of the system. Um, the end of rock walls is really tricky, and that's usually where we see neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor arguments, you know? One person puts in a rock wall to protect themselves, and then the neighbor beside them, after the next big storm or the next winter, uh, they experience more erosion. So we have this challenge right from the get-go, right? We want to do what's right, we want to do what is helpful to our own space and that would save our land, and we don't necessarily want to harm our neighbor, of course, but inadvertently we do. And so our, our plant-based system uh, plants that edge up, that active edge. We found through our research and study that plants are far more resilient to change uh, they have this inherent ability to grow back. You know, a branch breaks off the tree, the tree still lives, right? It keeps growing. If, uh, if a shrub is crushed by a winter storm, it'll come back up from the roots, you know? So these plants have this inherent resiliency embedded in them. So why couldn't we take that resiliency and work with it and see if we could partner uh, these plant communities together in order to really help solve some of these challenges. So we can see some different uh, shorelines there. The one on the far right is uh, above a rock wall as well. And it has a beautiful cobble beach that helps to break up some of the rolling waves that come in. And we've added a lot of coarse woody debris in the form of uh, driftwood and, uh, and grasses growing in through there. So that helps to absorb and soften that flow of water in and out of the system. Of course, with everything, it doesn't work everywhere, and, uh, and we need to really remember that there's a, a bunch of things we can do, not just one answer to any challenge. So this is our pamphlet. You'll notice we have them on the tables. They're in English and French, and I really do apologize that my my grade six French is just not good enough to speak up here in front of you all, so thank you for uh, being generous of spirit and not uh, uh, deflating that too much. In the pamphlet, you'll see that there we have four tips. Uh, one is about renaturalizing the upland, the upland area. So rather than mowing all the way to the edge, the crest of your shoreline, if we leave a space that is unmowed and un, 
touched really. Uh, we call it a buffer zone. In some, re in some regions, we have a buffer zone that is mandated by the municipality and they'll say you have to be 50 feet back from the crest. In Amherst, I know they've, uh, a few years ago, they passed legislation 150 feet back from the edge. In my area, there's no legislation. You can plant your house right at the edge if you want and no one's gonna bother you about it. Not so smart sometimes, right? If it's gonna be eroding out from underneath us. So we wanna take these buffer zones with a bit of a, a grain of salt and say, what, how much further can I do? How big is my land? And really, how far back can I safely be from the edge and still maintain all the things I love about living on the coast, having that beautiful view, wide open view of the, the ocean in front of us, and, uh, and how do we maintain that? So when we re-naturalize the upland meadows and forests, we're, we're asking you to kind of back off from the edge. That fragile edge that is slipping away from us, can we step back a little bit? You know, we often talk to families and they'll say, oh, well, you know, we need to play croquet and we have a dog and we like to throw the frisbee and, you know, all these reasons to have a big lawn between us and the ocean. And that's fine, you know, maybe we can change some of those habits or encourage us to back up even just a little. Um, and if we can, that's wonderful. When we add vegetation in that zone, we are really thinking about what's going on below the ground. And this brings me to one of the other points. When we um, establish plant cover and we add biomass to the banks, we are creating a long-term feeding, um, uh, feeding potential for that plant system. So if we imagine trees and shrubs and perennials growing along our boundary lines especially, and through the frontage of our land, if we let it naturalize and go back to being a meadow with grains and grasses and beautiful flowers and maybe a few shrubs and berries and things, we can always prune to keep the view plane open, right? Every great piece of art has a wonderful frame around it, so why not a beautiful tree or a shrub as an edge? And if we step back a little from not mowing, then we're not producing that compaction that's created when we push a lawnmower week in, week out for 30 odd years of owning a piece of land, right? Usually we have a 25 year mortgage or something like that. We've done the data crunching and you know, my 100 pounds and the 100 pounds of a lawnmower for 30 years back and forth really does compact the soil even more so if we're using a, a farm tractor or a bigger tool. And so just imagine this fluffy, absorbent soil horizon being slowly squished, right? There's no more space for the water to go. There's no more room for the critters to breathe in there. So it becomes somewhat of a desert. And when that happens, we end up with overland flow and washouts and there's no capture of the, the benefits of that water. So it just escapes quickly. When it escapes and it reaches over the edge of that face, it tumbles down over the rocks or the debris or whatnot's there, and it takes sediment with it and off it washes into the ocean. So we're losing a lot of our land just by our overuse of that precious buffer zone. So when we uh, can slow that down, we can hold on to sediment and we can trap some plants in there. The wonderful thing that the plants do for us is they have aggressive roots. Who's ever tried to weed gout weed out of their garden, right? It's challenging. Or uh, Japanese knotweed on the corner of your property. Like, you're never getting rid of that stuff, right? So these root systems have this tenacity this tenacious ability to knit themselves together, especially if they're of their own kind, right? And when we mix trees and shrubs and perennials and ground covers together, and we have really long roots or really wide spreading roots or very bunchy up roots or spaghetti roots, all of that diversity 
helps us to knit this underground cage of roots, which really does help to bind and hold the soil together. When we can do that binding and holding, we are less experiencing the erosional effects of that overland flow, right? So we have these little uh, icons to remember us, remind us. One of them says, reduce the slope grade. Often we'll see the water running up to a beach and it runs up into the beach and over the dune and maybe it continues on into nature or it slowly runs back down the dune and out to sea again and in and out, in and out. When we have cliff edges, we notice that the water rushes in and it bangs into the cliff and it chews away at the bottom, right? We call that scouring. If there's rocks and debris down there, we can bash it around and float it for a while and spin it and get all these vortexes going, and then you'll really notice a big gouging out from underneath. Eventually, the top is weakened and it slumps down again, right? And you'll see that happening over and over. The next big storm then takes that whole chunk of land away, and then we've lost 10 feet off our frontage. You know, these are aggressive storms that happen, and that consistency of our weather patterns just really uh, eats away at our plan. So this is a nice little reminder of some things that we can do. If we have a, a steeply sloped frontage, we can grade it back. We can make it more around the angle of repose, something around a 45 degree angle, maybe even 30 degrees is a little bit uh, slope, slopier and the energy and the waves can run up that 30 degrees and then back down. And if it's vegetated, it'll leave sediment there and you'll actually see it gaining rather than depleting as it, as it goes away. If you notice how the waves come in, they're patterned, right? They roll in and there's a pattern about every seventh one is bigger than the others. And so this consistency is what we're trying to work with. How do, we, how do we work against a consistent force that's always there, day and night, no matter if it's uh, stormy or windy or calm or not? That energy is constantly coming in towards the land. When we understand that the energy flows in a sine curve, do you all remember grade seven science and sine, cos, tan? Remember doing those math questions and equations? These waves are patterned. And so what we found is that when we have the root systems there, sometimes we need rocks and boulders for sure to help break that energy. But when we have the, the root systems and the plants as well as rock, we're even more resilient, right? So we can think about designing now because there's options. I'm gonna switch to the next slide here. Again, this is just page two, and so you'll have this on your, uh, on your tables with you. Um, when we are working with uh, clients, we often try to partner with community groups and organizations, with the local bylaws and permitting offices, of course, making sure that we're doing everything that is uh, correct and permitted and, uh, and really trying to gather the momentum of the people so that we can work together one neighbor to another neighbor and we can help each other to learn and manipulate the systems so that we can really determine how are we going to slow this down. We call them plant recipes and so we have different plant recipes depending on the type of soil the type of weather that you experience, whether it's a high energy or a low energy location, how much energy is coming in through those big storms. Are we really getting pounded every time there's a big storm or we only get hit once in every 20 years or so? We know things are changing, so we really encourage people to take lots of pictures and measure and watch what's happening on your specific piece of land or on the community park or the beach that's in your neighborhood. By paying attention, we are more well informed and we can really then develop a plan that's much more succinct and more able. 
Here's a landscape that we've been working on for a while now, and you'll see in this picture three different zones. On the far left, there's a whole lot of rocky rubble here. These are big chunks of construction debris that people have been putting here, chunks of concrete, there's rebar mixed in them, there's mixed sediment in there, there's foreign entities, um, and then there's also some uh, sediment, sedimentary stone here. This is in Murray Harbor near the Cape Bear Lighthouse in PEI. Kind of sticks out on the far east end of the, of the island. On the far left of this photograph, you'll see work that we've done years ago. And you can see that there's little trees growing in there and shrubberies and perennials. We're, they're all above that rocky work. And, uh, and we've become quite successful in this location in particular at knitting that soil horizon together. Of course, the soil is very consistent. It's very sandy. It has some clay in it, of course, that beautiful red clay that we love about PEI. The plants really take hold there very well and very quickly. So we feed them well and we um, add more to the uh, ecosystem as needed. You can see in the center some of our strategies that we're using here. We're trying to slow the flow of water from coming down over that slope. The bottom is somewhat protected by that rocky work, but you can see on the far right how it's inundated. It's gone underneath, and there's that dark cavern that's eroding away underneath there. We've used a lot of hay bales and staking. We've built some things called brush walls. And then as we move over to the right, we see that there's a real green blanket laying on top of that very steep section. In cases where the cliff is so steep that you can't actually dig in it, it's like almost vertical, our team have been well trained in all the safety aspects of rappelling. And so we go over the edge with all of our body strappings on and all of our safety ropes and things with sod blankets. You know, the sod you buy at Home Depot or wherever, uh, it comes in big rolls, right? So we unroll it and we stake it in place with usually about 12 inch um, pieces of alder or willow or red osier dogwood or even sometimes the Rosa Virginiana. That's the rose that we see along the ocean, right? She's very aggressive and she really likes to grow fast. So we make these small stakes that are well rooted we drive a rebar in there, and then we pull the rebar out and put the willow in. And so that willow root starts to grow above ground, of course. We get leaves and structure. It helps to deflect some of the wind. And then the sod blankets can start to grow. They adhere onto that clay, sandy soil really well. And within 24 hours, we see little roots starting to find their way into the cliff edge. After a year or so, the grass, of course, is growing. It's trapping seeds and debris that blow around in the neighborhood. Little uh, shrubs start to grow, perennials. We get raspberry canes. And all of the successional plants come at that first succession stage. It's very risky work. We've got our hard hats on and our straps under our chin because it's, it's risky. We could be falling. This is a 90-foot tall cliff. Um, so it's, uh, it's for the young at heart. I only do it when I really have to. All the young people in my team get to do that exciting work. Um, and as we are moving to the right, we'll just keep adding more and more. <coughs> now the homeowners have a, a, a contract with the local excavator fellow to pick up these pieces of rock and put them back in place every spring. Because of course, they get disturbed, right? They get out into the water, they float around a little bit during those big storms. I never thought rocks floated, but holy cow, when you see those big aggressive storms and you see big rocks being moved around, that water is so powerful, right? It's so strong. So every spring he comes along and in this instance, we were there before he got there so we can see that big cavern. But he assures me he's going to be moving all of that rock back into that place and so the toe of the slope will have 
some break in it, you know, it'll be able to break the energy of those waves. So this is an interesting case. We can see that there's a forest above it uh, in some place. In some places on this property, they were mowing right to the edge and simply dumping their mowing clippings, their leaves from raking the lawn and so on over the edge. And that's okay. We've encouraged them to move back a little. We always kind of giggle about the social acceptance of the no mow zone in your family. You'll have to determine that. We like to say a minimum is five meters or 15 feet. If you can back up 15 feet and not mow there and just let it grow back, it's not going to block your view immediately. It's going to take time to revegetate. But as it goes through the successional patterns from going a mowed lawn through to being a forest again, that's going to be a long time, but it'll quickly start to grow more roots. And we'll see that change is happening. There's not as much overland flow and thus not as much erosion. You can see at the top on the far right there, again, there's this darkness in the photo. There's an undercutting. And how many people have ever spilled milk on the table, right? You see the cup fall over and you think, oh boy, the milk runs to the edge of the table, it drips down, and it starts to drip on the floor, but there's another part of it that actually scoots back underneath about four to six inches. There's this electricity, magnetic energy and fluids that allows them to hang on to the table and then they'll start to drip over here, right? And if you don't catch it, you're gonna be in trouble because your wood's gonna all rot and whatnot underneath there. The same principles happen here on the shoreline with the overland flow, it gets to the edge, it drips and drips and drips, and of course, every water drop is so powerful, it displaces soil, it displaces energy, and then eventually it rolls underneath, and we call it a sod blanket. The blanket is being held just in suspension by all those root systems. The water catches underneath there and it starts to drip again. Eventually, it drips enough that it eats away enough and those roots will fall down. Sometimes those sod blankets catch hold again and they start to grow. And we can see it kind of covering like a blanket that, that edge. And that's really the best case scenario, right? If mother nature can allow that to happen slowly, the trees don't just rip off and end up in the ocean, but just a gentle fall, then they can re-adhere and start to grow. Then we can start planting all around it again, right? Because we're not on that steep space. Not, doesn't happen all the time, unfortunately. All right, we'll slide on to the next one here and see what happens. This is a place in Halifax at the St. Mary's Boat Club. And this shoreline was way too steep to allow people to have access there. It's an open, um, Thank you. It's an open uh, public boat club, so anyone can go there anytime. But there was this one section that was super steep, and they were afraid of liability issues and children tumbling down to the water. So you can see there's a horizontal line there. There's a chain link fence around this one section. Where they put up the fence and deterred humans from being there, the nature grew back really fast. It took about 15 years. Can see some of these small trees that are existing there. They weren't there before because people were trying to get down to the beach and they would be walking on there and compacting the soil and displacing seeds and whatnot and nothing was growing there. As soon as you eliminated the humans from the space, it started to grow back. And sure enough, it became much stronger. And now we're only seeing erosion at the very bottom and only at really extreme storms. So we're having some success here just by eliminating the human um, experience on that space. Of course, we don't want to eliminate our ability to enjoy the shoreline. So we've had to, you know, just move people's habits and change the patterns and have stairwells and things like that in place so that we're not causing erosion by enjoying the shoreline. Again, here's another uh, side view of it where we can see these, the dynamics of this zone, right? Things are moving, things are changing all the time. I want to just point out this idea of the high watermark, the rack line. 
we used to be able to walk along the shore, see that deposit of seaweed parallel to the shoreline and think, oh, okay, that's where the seaweed has dropped out of the water. Um, that's the rack line. That must be the high water mark. Well, Mother Nature just thought that was the wrong idea, I guess, because now with sea level rise, right, we're seeing that the rack line doesn't mean the high water mark anymore. That's just an episode where things drop. So we have to start thinking about the dynamics of that toe of the slope where the water's coming and going. That's changing how quickly it comes and goes. Sea level rise means it's coming up higher and deeper into the land. And then we have storm surge, which is really giving us power at that active edge. So the toe of the slope, the high water line, those are all moving targets. So there used to be a time where you could get a permit and they would say, as long as you're 50 feet above the high water line, we don't care what you're doing. In fact, a lot of property owners think that they own to the high water mark, right? So 10 years ago, it used to be way back there and now it's right here, right? So things are changing and that's all this climate change and sea level rise stuff that we're experiencing. So when we see this rack line now, we measure it, we stake it, we photograph it, and then we try to have consistently photographed evidence so that we can see the dynamic change there and then make adjustments to our plan. In most cases, uh, below the high water line is regulated and you need to have permits from either provincial government uh, through the Department of Transport or Department of Oceans and Fisheries in order to do work below that high water line. And as I say, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was easy to know where that line is, and now it's a little fuzzy, right? Things are different now. So we always engage the permit offices and those at the, uh, the municipal guidelines and whatnot to find out how those regulations are changing, if at all. Um, I know in Nova Scotia, just this last week, we were promised a coastal act, right? We've been lobbying for about 10 years now uh, in partnership with the Ecology Action Center to get a coastal policy in place because people are still building their houses right on the edge and we're seeing that that's not the safest place for us anymore. So once we get some regulations in place and some more clarity around uh, the challenges that we're having there, hopefully that'll mitigate some of these issues that we're seeing from the homeowner's perspective, for sure. So we're seeing things here, right? Exposed roots, overhanging side blankets, sediment moving, the freeze-thaw cycle is really changing, especially when we have, uh, you know, plus 12 one day, minus 22 the next day, right? Things are happening quickly. We're going to see more of that. And this is another, um, this washing idea, the idea of sorting of sized materials. When we notice that, we know that uh, things are really speeding up in the change range because uh, the sediment has been washed out and now all the stones that would have been locked in the embankment have come out and are laying on the beach. We may notice that there's bigger rocks on the beach and different size rocks. And there's this activity <coughs> called sorting that the wave activity kind of washes over them and sorts them out. So um, when we see these clusters of boulders or me medium-sized rocks, we know that we're in a really active zone. All right, has anyone, um, I know in, in my area in Bridgewater, we have a straight pipe problem, right? Uh, we also have a problem with uh, just our, our um, storm water management where we have our basement drain uh, piped out to the ocean, piped out to the edge. These pipes, this is an old one of course, but um, these pipes actually cause erosion too because they're a consistent flow. It's like having your hose there just washing away the edge of the, of the water. So we're really encouraging builders and contractors, homeowners alike, to get those pipes pointing the other direction, right? They should be going into a forest or a marsh or a ditch at the very least, not over the edge out into the sea because that, that uh, it's like having your thumb on the edge of the garden hose. 
hose, right? If you have your tap on medium and you have your hose going, you can just let it flow. It'll fill up a hole or a, a absorb into your lawn, not cause too much trouble. As soon as you put your thumb on it, though, you can peel the paint off of something, right? That hose, that strength of the water. So we want to get all the outflows turned around and going the other direction into some other uh, rain garden or swales or ditches or what have you. There's all sorts of design opportunities there to alleviate this man-made pressure on the shore. Do any of you have uh, this kind of situation? We've seen quite a few homeowners that have, you know, the white pipe coming out of their sump pump from the basement, you know, the drain tile around your foundation, and out it goes, right? Water's water, it should go out there. And, uh, and it's, it's something to be said about seeing if you can rearrange that in some way. What about the old culverts? You see a lot of that. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And even between two properties, along the property line, we'll see a, a drainage ditch or a French drain even. Um, and those, anything that concentrates the flow of water is really problematic. So uh, we want to try and soften that down as much as possible. All right, and we talk about stairs. Adding stairs uh, that can be removed in the winter is a really great idea. Um, it's safer for us, for sure, that we have a handle to hold on to and we can actually walk downstairs instead of trying to get over the edge. Um, especially when they can be lifted up and brought in in the winter time so that we don't have those winter storms bashing up against that structure, right? When we think, when we keep remembering that this is a dynamic zone that's ever changing, and we drop a set of stairs in place that are meant to last forever, right? We are putting a hard, solid, static structure in a dynamic zone. That's not, that's just a recipe for disaster, right? You can't expect something to really last forever if it's in this dynamic space, right? Things are changing constantly. Any of these uh, solid entities are gonna get wiped out one way or another. So small scale structure, lifting them up and moving them aside really is helpful. Here's a, uh, a landscape. This is also in Prince Edward Island. This is on the south shore this time. This homeowner had a 300 foot buffer zone. That's a lot, right? Thank goodness they did. The old farmer who used to live, uh, who used to own this field, was chatting with us one day and he said, see that boat way out there? You know that herring boat way out there? That's where my barn used to be. He lost like a mile over his lifetime of the land, right? And we were like, oh, come on. And then he brought out the maps and it was true, right? The land used to be way out there. And he said, listen, little lady, you know, those plants in that rock wall aren't gonna hold up. And maybe not, but maybe we should give it a try, right? Nothing else is working. How about we try this? Now for this instance, the homeowner uh, contracted a rock wall contractor. Of course, he's building rock walls with sedimentary stone, which is gonna just crush away eventually. They also, unfortunately, put geotextile fabric underneath the rocks. So now the rocks are kind of sitting on a slip and slide, right? Y'all had yourselves or grandkids going down a nice steep hill on a toboggan, <laughs> you know, or sliding on the, in the summertime with a, on a slip and slide. So these rocks are now floating on top of this fabric. Because of their makeup, when they bang together, they're just breaking apart. Um, but we also see a similar kind of challenge with armor stone, the big roadside rock, that big quartzite, heavy, you know, people think that that'll last in there. Um, and because of its angular components, it can lock into place a lot, a lot easier. And that's why they use it where there's big infrastructure like roads and power and uh, churches and cemeteries and things along the edge here. Because it does, of its angular nature, it can lock together, um, but it still can be displaced by water, just as we see down the road here. So the missing component is that knitting together of the soil horizon, right? 
if the rocks are moving, they're scouring away at the soil behind them. That's why we intuitively put the fabric so that it doesn't smash up against that sand and that soil. Um, however, that fabric only lasts for a little while, right? It's just cloth, it's UV sensitive, it starts to break down just like any other synthetic does in the elements. And so that cloth um, is only a temporary band-aid, so to speak. So what we tend to do is try to uh, impregnate that zone with the plant community that should be there. So knowing who your plants are, how they grow, how aggressive are their root systems, which are buddies, you know, just like companion planting in your vegetable garden. Usually you put tomatoes and basil together. They like to grow together. Uh, carrots and garlic don't like each other, so we don't usually plant those guys together. But when we have these plants, like the red osier dogwood, the alders, the sumacs, the hackamack, hackamattack trees, or tamarack, poplar, maple, birch, uh, white spruce, all of these different trees and shrubs and perennials have different kinds of roots. And just like we talked about at the beginning, when they latch on to each other, that's a bond that can very rarely be broken apart. Have any of you read The Hidden Life of Trees? Great, only one person. All right, well that's gonna be my mission now is to encourage you to go and get that book. You can read it online. It was on the New York Times bestsellers list for about two years, um, The Hidden Life of Trees. There's even a small video on YouTube that you can grab now. This video, this book, explains how the root systems attach one to another, how they share information, they share water, they share nutrients, they help each other uh, fight against, battle against insects and diseases. They send out pheromones and hormones and enzymes. They talk to each other in this chemical kind of way. When these plants attach and the more diversity of the community attach, uh, they create this underground kind of like chicken wire, right? They fuse together, that uh, fuse that is rarely broken and they can knit and hold together our soul horizon. So that wave energy that's being broken by the big rock wall now uh, has a little bit of bounce back. There's some absorption of the energy into the land and the soils are protected by this uh, knitting together of the shoreline. So when we add the plants, we see that the rock walls last much longer. They are much more resilient to change they uh, don't pop, uh, rocks don't pop out from them, amongst them, as frequently. The uh, freeze-thaw cycles aren't as aggressive and don't act as trickly on these rock walls because they're shaded by the canopy of the plants, right? If the sun can't reach the soil, and then there's less activity in the freeze-thaw cycling. So if we can, cover the plants, cover the soil with plant material and shade it and buffer it from all of those elemental kind of effects, we have greater resilience. Not that it won't happen. A Hurricane Sandy, a Hurricane Irene is going to blow everything apart anyway, right? We saw basically half of New York be inundated with water during Hurricane Sandy and all of the Jersey Shore be completely devastated. A few plants are not going to change that. Right? But in the meantime, between that big tragic storm and the next one, we can settle down and work things out so that we have a little more action there and a little more protection. So you can see how this meadow had been mowed for 50 odd years or 100 years or more. Um, I don't know if you can really tell the difference from the mow zone we see that it's being mowed back there. We've taken 15 meters off the mowing of this field, uh, allowing the grasses to grow. We've added some big chunks of driftwood that we found on the beach. There's a, a, a line of hay bales 
We put them in triangularly so that the energy can come in and absorb and catch all of that material and water and seaweed, but it can also escape and get back down through there. We've planted in all of these rocks and crevices, getting in there, open a small hole in the geotextile, get that willow right in tight, that sumac, the alder, all of those great plants, stick them in there really well. When we don't have geotextile behind the rocks, we need to grow our soil. As you can imagine, a cliff edge being fairly vertical, and then they add a 45 degree angle of rock and rock and rock. If you're trying to get plants in here, they aren't going to reach the soil for a while, right? So we can do some planting at the top, but this big cavity in here, this large void between those rocks, we need to actually grow the soil there. So we stuff seaweed and hay and leaf debris and lawn debris and branches and twigs and things. We generate a living or strategic composting within the rock structure itself. That takes a year or so to really ferment down and create a growable surface. And that's when we start getting the willow in there and the red osier dogwoods and all of those really aggressive shrubs that we like to plant. Generally, it takes about three years to grow enough capacity to actually see a change. Uh, we have clients who are on lifetime contracts because their place is so aggressively being hit all the time. The rock walls are falling apart consistently. So we are in there for the long haul, building up our ability to withstand that pressure. If you remember that our earth is just a big ball of rock, right? And no matter where we go, if we drill down deep enough through that soil, we're going to get to the rock. So when we see the rock walls happening, we think, okay, that's just stage one. Now we need to superimpose on top of that this light, fluffy, fleshy layer that has resilience. Right? So we're thinking about rebirthing, regrowing nature. We are restoring the natural habitat. That's why it's called restoration ecology or ecological restoration, right? We're restoring what used to be there so that we can have that experience of strength and resiliency once again. All right, here we go. Um, so here's a couple examples in Halifax, a really heavily mowed landscape. Um, and in Upper La Have, just outside of Bridgewater, no mowing and lots of diversity and lots of strength and tenacity here. Now that's not to be said that we don't see change right here, right? But you can see the seagrass or the hay, the ocean hay. Um, we've planted it up really heavily. We plant it by the square foot. We try to get 12 plants per square foot so that we have like a three inch grid. Um, and so we plant really heavily. Uh, there's some rocks there. There was a previous homeowner that had built a rock wall at the toe of the slope. We planted that up. We've got our native uh, bayberry and um, high, bush, uh, high bush and low bush blueberries, huckleberries, sweet fern. There's some white pine in here, some oak. And, uh, and this is a, a beautiful view of it in the fall, right? It looks gorgeous. It's tight. It's connected, it's not eroding, and this is, uh, this is since 2009, so almost, almost nine years now, almost 10 years, of uh, really great strength and tenacity going on. Is that on fresh water or salt water? This is on the Lahave River okay. at the mouth of, um, like almost at Riverport. You know, so we're getting all of that pressure funneling okay. up the Lahave River. It's a very aggressive location. Yeah, but it is in uh, it is in the limit. But uh, just to uh, add fresh water plants. Uh, there's both. It's fresh water coming from the inland out to sea, and then there's tidal water pulling in. And here we have a, about a three foot tidal cycle. Yeah, so the water's changing by about three feet. Yeah, so. Wonderful uh, question. The estuary or the brackish water zones are even more abundant, right? We've got all those freshwater plants and critters and all the salty critters too and plants. 
and having those both connected. Um, that's why our estuaries are so strong, right? And our marshes are so strong because we have the benefit of both the inland and the tidal regional plants working together. Yeah. And once we have the critters moving in here, back in here too, right? Uh, then we've got the poop loop happening. You all know about poop loop, right? Yeah, so the, the plants and the plants attract the critters. It's kind of a chicken and egg thing, I guess. You can't have the critters without the plants and vice versa. And so when the critters come in and they start eating the seeds and the pollen and the flowers um, and making habitat and homes underneath those roots and digging in, once they're there and they're eating and pooping and eating and pooping again, we have a consistent feeding loop, right? All that manure is free now. So we don't have to feed them so much. Which brings me to a point. Um, we have yellow uh, slips of paper at each of your chairs. And so this is my way of answering your questions strategically and, and uh, pointedly. If you have questions that you would uh, like me to answer for you, please write them down. Uh, there's a little place there that says, tell me your landscaping challenge. On the back, you can write a bigger uh, dialogue there with a bigger question. My goal is to reach out to each and every one of you in the coming days and respond to those questions and challenges. And if I don't have the answer, I will find it. We have a great team of researchers back at the office, and so we'll send that off to you either by phone or email. Um, my point is that we have a couple draws. So if you're so kind to tell me what your problems are so I can continue working and solving those for you, uh, we have our bottle of abundance, which is our, um, we make this fertilizer. It's uh, liquid kelp and mycorrhizal fungi. And this is a heavy concentrate. You can, can't hardly see through it. It's a glass mason jar. It should be clear, right? Um, so this we mix to at least 40 to one. Also, I go up to about 80 to 1, especially if I have plants that I need to like do a foliar spray, right? Get rid of a white fly or a little uh, uh, spider mite or any of those kinds of things or feed my plants from the top. So this is a really lovely concoction that we've uh, generated over the 18 years of business that we've been at. It's the only fertilizer that we use in our company and, uh, and we sell it at retail as well. But we're gonna draw for this uh, which is about um, a liter is worth about 80 liters of food. So you get about 40 liters of food out of this. It should last you for about a year, uh, at least this growing season. And then I have one of our nice black ball caps to give away too. So Ellen uh, will pick up your yellow slips at the end of the day. So if you don't have a question, that's all right. Still fill it in because uh, your name's going to go in for the draw. And we'll do two draws before we head out for our walk, okay? So that's a little bonus there. The reason I wanted to bring that up was because it's the mycorrhizal fungi that actually attaches the root system to the soil. So we've been talking about binding the soil together and holding it in place with all these wonderful roots and really having that diversity so that we have all the different kinds of roots so we have greater uh, impact in the binding activity. This uh, mycorrhizal fungi fertilizer helps to feed that fungus. It is an inoculant so that as soon as you plant and you put some of that on there, immediately those little root hairs are gonna get excited and they're gonna seek out the soil. And when they find it, they're gonna be able to have the attachment. You kind of think of it as the marriage counselor of the soil system. <laughs> yeah, so that's great. So I see our time is moving along and I don't want to bore you too much. Here's another lovely shoreline that we've been working on. I wanted to just point out that uh, again, we see that the sea hay or the sea grasses, they're very fine out here in the uh, intertidal zone. We have a little bit coarser grass up uh, into the shore. You can see the old rock wall that's still there. And then all of this debris, that light uh, green, pine boughs that we had to cut down a pine tree on the property and so now we are protecting a open edge by weaving the pine boughs in so that they're tight it's like knitting it together um, we all know how well 
weave works, right? We wear it every day in our clothing. And so if we can weave that upper part as well as the soil part, wow, do we ever have a strong system to go with. So this is what we're encouraging people to get to work at. Of course, uh, we always want to bring the little kids in. This is a beach experience in Kingsburg Beach on the South Shore where we've been noticing a large storm came up and over the dune and washed all the soil off the backside of the dune. So we had a contractor put all the soil back and then we had to replant that whole uh, face of the dune. And a great way to get a lot of work done especially if you want to have a random design, is to offer a bunch of kids a little activity, right? So we brought the grade threes from the local French school out, and they helped us plant about 500 plants into this little swatch that had been uh, harmed at, during that storm. There's nothing more random than asking a child to place out the plants, right, and get some diversity happening. So that was really fun, and that's just some of our workers there hanging out with them. So again, the big theme, the big idea is that we can't actually do this all our own, right? We need collaborative efforts. If each of us, you know, only think about our 100 feet of frontage and we do something and then the neighbor does something different and then the other neighbor does something different and then the municipality comes in and does something different again and we're all disjointed, it's like a big mishmash, right? It doesn't fuse together, it doesn't knit itself. When we can speak to a group like this is such a wonderful honor because each of you now will have just a little seed of an idea. Maybe you'll talk to your neighbor. Maybe you'll talk to the other neighbor. It'd be great if all three of you could come together with a solution and that would be stronger in the long run, right? Instead of one person doing concrete blocks, someone else just throwing some tires over the edge, someone else doing some plants, right? If we can be consistent and cohesive together, neighbor to neighbor, community to community, we can really build that resilience over the long run. So I super encourage you to do that. All right, let's see where we're at here. So there's five things that you can do. This is getting to the end here. So we'll, we'll be ready for some good questions soon. Um, and I also wanted to note that if any of you would like the PowerPoint presentation, Put a little note on your yellow sheet and I'll email it off to you, okay? It's too cumbersome to try to print it and have it as a handout and whatnot, but it's super easy to email. So if you'd like to take it to your town council and show them, or invite me in to have a chat, or even just have coffee with your neighbors, throw it on, the, on your uh, laptop and have a look at some of these options. Um, I really encourage you to do that, okay? The goal for me is to share as much information with you as I can through this process today, okay? So reducing the mowing, number one, easiest thing. Even if you don't have an erosion problem yet, I would encourage you to stop mowing to the edge. Even if it's one or two mower widths, why? That's a good start, right? I would encourage that for sure. If you can come back more, like I was saying, 45 feet seems to be the ideal for the root connectivity that is really helpful in our, in our coastlines. All right, the next one, strategic, compost strategically. So all that material that we you know, put into our compost bins that just gets laid in the back 40 somewhere, thrown under a tree, put it to use, right? All those decomposers, all those little bugs and all that poop is really important you can fill in some cracks between your rock wall or behind your wharf even or wherever you have your shoreline, however it looks to you. If you can use that material to a greater benefit, get those bugs to do some work for you, that's a bonus, right? Once you start that system of growth going, adding plants will be way easier. You won't have to fiddle with them and feed them and worry about them. They'll just grow. Again, plants are living, breathing creatures, just like me and you, and all they want to do is live, right? You break a branch off, heck, you even take the top off a tree, it's still going to grow, right? Even if you mow down that shrub by mistake, it's going to generate roots again and come back up. So let's try and think about those plants as a tool and also as an ally in our uh, quest for a little more security on the coastline. The other thing is not to burn brush. 
I know spring is coming and a lot of people burn their lawns off or they'll burn off you know, piles of debris that they've collected over the winter, storm damage, trees they've had to take down and things. Burning really releases all of those greenhouse gases back into the soil, into the system, and it really is going backwards, right? It's kicking us in the pants again. If we cannot burn and use it to our benefit, once again, those decomposers that are going to eat that all up are going to be a real great benefit to us. And if you don't want to use it, offer it up to a neighbor or a community project. We're always looking for debris and going around catching up with all of these things. All right, so the next one then is build stairs and ramps, right? Stairs and ramps that aren't sitting on the ground themselves because they too then are a hard structural entity in that dynamic system. They got to kind of float a little bit, right? So the property in Kingsburg that I showed you with those children, they had a boardwalk sitting on the ground and when the storm came, that was the weak link, right? And it just flowed right down their decade, right into their house and flooded their house out. So we lifted that up and planted it all up with plants and we haven't seen a big change, you know, uh, uh, any more damage as far as that goes. So things that are up on stilts or that uh, are as least connectivity as possible, kind of floating on top. All right, so here's a nice healthy shoreline, right? And here's that thing about pruning that view. I wish I had bent down just a little deeper so you could see the view. This is looking out at Porkham's Island. It's really beautiful space. Um, my point was that you can have trees and shrubs and grasses and perennials and it can look beautiful and be attractive and feed you with blueberries and raspberries and it doesn't have to impede your view. Right? We pruned the bottom limbs off those trees. We've got that beautiful framing of the view plane out there. As I said, all great art has nice wooden frames usually, or some kind of a frame at least. Um, why not use the trees as the frame, right? A little pruning here and there, you can get some beautiful windows out, it makes the view far more interesting. Birds flying in and out of the space, maybe you have eagles coming down, all kinds of critters uh, hanging out in those trees. So. It, what we've done to manage the trees and shrubs in the foreground is every now and then, maybe one year or two, we just come and either snap off the tops of those little young pine trees so they stay kind of short and chubby. Uh, every now and then we'll take a hedge trimmer and just at waist height, just kind of walk around and do this, do sweeping it. Um, and I also find it very interesting when people think about the view out to the sea. They don't want anything but that grass showing. And I say, how often are you actually laying right on the grass looking at your view, <laughs> right? Hardly ever, right? I don't, I don't know any time that I've actually laid on my belly to see the view of the ocean um, on that lawn. So usually we're in a chair, right? Or we're in our house, which is also a little bit higher. So I would really encourage you to get in your favorite chair, sit in your house, have a look. <coughs> You know, have someone stand out there with a measuring tape and say, what is actually the allowable height there? Can I get a two-foot shrub to grow? Can I encourage roses to live along that shoreline, some wildflowers, some greens and grasses? The answer is probably yes. I don't know anybody who's laying on their kitchen floor looking out a window like this, right? We're at least four or five feet tall anyhow, looking out that way. So if we had a two foot shrub, not a problem at all, right? The benefit of those roots is like a hundred times the value of that view for sure. And if you want to keep the view, you want to maintain living in there, you got to do something, right? Or it's all going to just wash away. Great, thank you. So here's this lovely house. It used to be completely mowed right down to the shore. We saw all kinds of erosion. The house, uh, you know, from the bird's eye view is really only about 40 feet from the toe of the slope. But of course it's going up this lovely slope, this lovely hill. Uh, and so they thought, oh well, we can't plant anything there. That's going to impede our view. Well, the windows are way the heck up there, right? So once we demonstrated that activity, we actually had them sit in their favorite chair and stand at the kitchen window and sit on the deck and hang out with their kids on the lawn they realized, oh yeah, the slope drops off really quickly. We can totally let some plants grow down there, right? Yeah, so that was great. Okay, 
look again. Here's just a couple uh, examples of some of the things we do. I talked about the weaving of debris. In the very center there is alder. And so we, uh, and this is uh, the beach on the top right hand, on the top left hand, I'm sorry, that's Hurdles Beach in Kingsburg. And the cliff is very uh, granular, rocky, nasty, moving constantly. Things are not wanting to grow there a whole lot. And so um, what we did was we wove these mats really tight. The spacing was about one inch between one piece and the other piece. And so when we wove these mats together and anchored them on these plateaus on this slope, as the sediment and the erosion continued, so remember we're not stopping it, right? We can't stop the erosion, we're just working with it. As the sediment continued to flow down the slope, it got tangled up in these weavings, and the next spring, all of them germinated, right? And sent out sprouts, and now we have this bush all growing there. It's all woven in on the bottom. The sediment continues to move and kind of bank up behind it, creating another plateau, another opportunity to plant some plants there. So that's been a really great experience. Um, we have a brush wall down here at the base of these big pines. You can hardly see it now that the pine straw has all, uh, the pine litter has all covered it. Another pine situation here where we've got white pine and a brush wall. And the one in the top right hand corner shows this kind of rocky toe, right? Boulders down at the rock at the bottom of the slope. Hay bales up in behind them. They're starting to sprout and grow. And in behind the hay bales are willow. It's a long leaf. This is the golden twig willow. It's an Acadian heritage plant. Um, I got it from uh, uh, Windhorse Farm, who got it from, uh, what's it called there in the valley where the dikes are, in the Heritage Garden, Garden the Botanical Garden oh, there at uh, oh, Annapolis Royal, thank you. And so, you know, this wonderful heritage species, um, and it just loves to grow, it has a really tangly, far-reaching root system, sometimes 20 feet in length, and so it's perfect plant for this zone and uh, and that willow is knitting that shoreline all together for it. So that's really wonderful. Mm -hmm. All right. Next question. question. Salt resistant plants. Like yeah. when we're right on the ocean, like I lost a lot of plants I planted too early last year on the east side of the stone. And we had a windstorm and you know I lost half of what I spent. So that's an issue. Absolutely. Yeah, plants are, um, I, would, I would say, less costly than rocks, probably, right? Yes, definitely. And so if you lose a few of those, uh, it's a lot easier to replace a plant than it is to replace a rock when you consider in the excavator and the fossil fuels and all that stuff. So what I, what I tell people, what I encourage people is that when you do a plant-based solution, you should always think of setting yourself up a little nursery within your landscape. So if you can take cuttings, save seed, do layering with your plants so that you can continually be growing plants, right? A plant-based solution is not a one-shot deal. It's a, as things change, we add more plants. As we see a plant not working effectively anymore, we find a new plant with a different kind of root system to put it in there, or a new partner to make it stronger. So there's definitely ongoing work. That's when I mentioned the three, five, ten lifetime contracts that we have with our clients, especially those that are from away who aren't here to manage it on an ongoing basis, right? We might think of a rock wall being $100,000. A plant-based solution may be far less than that, but it's consistent work over time, right? And if you can be engaged to learn and to do some of these techniques, then the cost is greatly reduced, right? Than having to hire it out over and over again. So there's definitely some challenges there, but definitely ways that we can work around that. Yeah, thank you for asking. So we try to continue with this uh, theme of sustainability and, the, and an integrated planning model, which means that we take the three, uh, have you all seen the sustainability Venn diagram in other 
areas of your lives. Uh, usually it's people, environment, and economy, right? And in a lot of cases, people think of those as being the same size, each sphere being balanced. It's not necessarily true in the natural world and how things naturally work. You may have a large economy and can afford a $100,000 rock wall, but may only be small in your social context in that you don't have the manpower to do repair work or plant it up consistently or whatnot, but you have a great respect for the environment. So things can change. We've done jobs where people have a very small economy. They can't afford the big rock wall. What are we going to do to help these people? Well, we rally around the volunteers at the Ecology Action Center or other NGOs and other organizations, and we bring the manpower to the site, and then we plant like crazy, right? And we engage people. We make friends with people so that they can keep doing good work over time. So it doesn't need to be that they're in balance. They can be out of whack as long as we're aware of what that is and that we uh, take the innovation and the creativity to figure out a plan, right? So it can work for all, con all kinds of situations. All right, let's think one more time. So here's what is uh, typically happening. We have mowed edges, we have trees in isolation living in lawns, we might have a few plants at the base of the, of the uh, slope. What we really want to do is grow that. We want to mitigate the damage of the environment as much as possible. So here's what we're looking to do. We probably have rocks at the toe of the slope to break the energy of the water, right? We want to add more trees and much more diversity. We want to make sure that we have all sorts of different root systems growing below grade and attaching to each other. So we need to know who's friends, right? Who does a spruce tree like to live with? The best way to do it is to just be really familiar with your shoreline and see who's growing underneath the spruce tree. Maybe it's a fern, maybe it's a squirrel, maybe it's some kind of a shrub, right? You gotta to try to attach those ecosystems back together. We're reinventing ecosystem. When we have lots of plants, the rain that comes down bounces off of the big trees, off of the smaller trees, off of the shrubs, on and on and on, and the energy of those little tiny raindrops is greatly reduced because they've lost it over, right, over all of these plants. They've given their energy to the plants. The plants have wiggled and jiggled. They've excited their root systems to grow faster because they're wiggling and jiggling in space. When we have all of that diversity and the impact of this bouncing off effect, uh, we have a greater, more, susta more sustainable, and a greater stability within the ecosystem as a whole. So we've got to get these places planted back up, right? It wasn't until we started developing the shoreline that they weren't like that. Once we continued on with all of that development, now we're in a depleted state. All right, let's hit the next one. So again, I'm just reiterating our final moments here. Lots of participation is how we get through it. I think we'll um, just maybe skip through, see what the next one is here, things to consider. We've talked about all of these already. One more time. Speaking up, most important. Uh, if you don't tell your MLA or your municipality that you want regulations on the shoreline, it's not going to happen. Right? We've been lobbying Nova Scotia for almost 20 years and it just happened, right? Like we've got to have the patience, consistency, and tenacity to keep asking for what we want, right? We're seeing our neighbors' houses fall into the shore. I cannot afford for my home to fall into the shore. I cannot afford that to happen. I can't just go pick up my stuff and go build another house somewhere else, right? We've got to figure out a way to get around all of this. All right, let's see it again. And that's the end. So we're opening up for questions. I have my uh, flip chart here. If anyone wants to have a bathroom break or grab a drink or anything, um, I'll pull my flip chart in and we'll uh, answer whatever questions you have. If I don't have the answer, I promise to get back to you with one. Okay? We have a great team of researchers back at the office and uh, we'll figure it out for you. Okay?
Great. So feel free to grab a coffee.